Item number, SCP-207. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-207 is to be stored in a waterproofed locking metal container, measuring 1 meter by 0.5 meters by 0.5 meters. The key is to be issued to the current head researcher of Site's biocontainment area. SCP-207 is to be retained inside this area at all times, and all personnel entering the area should be checked for any food or drink items, in addition to any other searches required. Any staff seen ingesting SCP-2071 are to be retained for future study, with all Foundation clearance levels removed. All vending machines in Site are to only dispense clear carbonated beverages. Any variation from transparent is to be investigated immediately. Description: SCP-207 refers to a crate containing 24 Coca-Cola brand cola drinks. The bottles are designated SCP-207-A to X. SCP-207-B is currently the active bottle for testing, and no other bottles are to be opened without authorization from two Level 4 researchers. All bottles have been clearly labeled to aid identification. The liquid held inside these has been confirmed to be identical across all of SCP-207 and should not be ingested outside of supervised testing. The liquid has been classified as SCP-2071 and is to be treated as a Class II chemical hazard. SCP-2071 does not appear to alter with age. However, the active testing bottle should have its protective cover kept on the outside of removing liquid for testing. Mass spectroscopy and chemical tests have shown higher than usual concentrations of caffeine and sugars, both natural and artificial, along with data expunged. The practical effect of this is when a subject drinks SCP-2071, they will effectively no longer require sleep or rest, nor attempt to sleep or rest. This effect is not lessened by any soporific or medication yet tested on test subjects. However, only a quantity larger than 5 milliliters will cause this effect. The reason for this lower boundary existing has not yet been found, although it is hypothesized by Dr. C that data expunged. As such, unless authorized by two level 3 researchers, only 5 milliliters of SCP-2071 is to be used for testing. Amounts higher than this have shown no difference in effect, with the exception of the subject SCP-207 was recovered from. In addition to removing the need for rest, SCP-2071 also causes an increase in motor, reaction, and psychological functions. The increase is linear in progression, with an estimated 50% increase, measured by standard medical protocols, plus or minus 5%, every 6 hours. The practical application of ingestion is that the subject is able to think, react, and move faster than others who have not ingested SCP-2071. Mental proficiencies show the IQ of the subject to rise in line with other increases. However, SCP-2071 does not alter the body of affected subjects. Physiology remains unchanged, and as such, can rarely support the increase in activity. No subjects have lasted longer than 48 hours during testing, with the cause of death varying from massive internal organ failure to exsanguination due to major artery ruptures. Subjects also begin to show stress after roughly 24 hours, usually making each movement extremely carefully, in order to avoid accidents. Tests SCP-207-Alpha and Rho have shown that after approximately 24 hours, the increases caused by SCP-207-1 mean subjects can easily underestimate their speed. Most specifically, in test subject SCP-207-Rho, the subject was able to escape the containment area despite a 5-meter wall. However, this caused the test subject's internal bone structure data expunged. Addendum SCP-207 was recovered from college after reports of a student moving from failing grades in all areas, including physical sports, to top percentile marks and record-breaking performances in physical areas. Agent embedded in the local police force, brought said student in for interview. Subject revealed the existence of SCP-207 during the interview. However, escape attempt while Class A amnestics were being administered resulted in the subject violently data expunged. Cause of death, organ failure, 
due to massive internal hemorrhage. As SCP-207-A was empty on recovery, it is believed ingesting a full bottle data expunged. SCP-207 recovered from subject's home, SCP-207-A already empty. Subject reported to local police force as missing person. No further cause for surveillance of college required at this time. Item number SCP-210 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures The property containing SCP-210 has been designated as Site The primary responsibility of guards on said site is to prevent entry by trespassers and maintain the cover story detailed in Document 210-1. The servants' quarters adjacent to SCP-210 have been deemed safe for human habitation and may be used for on-site housing. A remotely controlled vehicle is to be sent into SCP-210 on a monthly basis to catalog any changes. Description SCP-210 is a two-story mansion flooded to a depth of 4.35 meters with an unknown fluid substance. The substance, designated SCP-210-1, possesses a refractive index nearly identical to water. This fluid is invisible from the outside of SCP-210 and does not flow out of SCP-210 if a door or window is opened. Any living creature that comes into contact with SCP-210-1 enters a sleep-like state and begins drifting through SCP-210-1 as if neutrally buoyant. Beings trapped in this manner are designated SCP-210-2. To date, Instances of SCP-210-2 have been catalogued by remote means. Instances of SCP-210-2 emit a constant stream of bubbles, as if exhaling, despite no source of air being identified, and subjects appearing to breathe as normal. Subjects have been noted to move through SCP-210-1 slowly, as if dancing. It has not been determined if this is under the power of the subjects, or of microcurrents within SCP-210-1. SCP-210 came to the attention of the Foundation when an agent embedded in the County Police Department received a number of related missing persons reports. Mobile Task Force IOTA-12, Damn Feds, was dispatched to intercept the investigations. The disappearances were quickly traced to a party held at SCP-210 in 2000 with several subsequent disappearances resulting from persons undergoing private investigations. Two team members were lost on initial contact with SCP-210, the first when entering through the front door, and the second while attempting to recover the first. The full documentation of this investigation can be found in Document 210-1. Addendum 210-1 Attempts to remove SCP-210-2 from SCP-210-1 have failed as instances of SCP-210-2 which reach the edge of SCP-210-1 will not travel any further. Instances of SCP-210-2 cannot be damaged. This property extends to clothing, evidenced by remote attempts to harvest sample material. Furniture and other inanimate objects within SCP-210-1 behave as if in normal atmospheric conditions and may be removed from the residence. Removed items show no anomalies. Addendum 210-2 The remote observation of SCP-210 in 2000 was unable to locate SCP-210-2-7. Note: We have been completely unable to locate SCP-210-7 on subsequent observations. A request has been placed for tracking devices in case of further disappearances. Researcher B Item Number SCP-214 Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-214 is to be contained in a 4x4 meter quarantine cell, suitable for long-term human habitation within Bioresearch Area 12. It is to be considered an etiological agent of a Level 4 biohazard. Level 4 biohazard containment requires clean rooms, pre- and post-entry decontamination showers, and a vacuum antechamber. All air and water sources to SCP-214's containment area are to be isolated from the rest of the area, 
All employees entering SCP-214's containment area must wear hazmat suits with self-contained oxygen supply and supplemental cut-resistant liner. The cell shall be under continuous observation using remote video surveillance. SCP-214 is to be considered a danger to itself and others, and shall not be allowed to possess potentially dangerous utensils. Due to SCP-214's distinct perception of pain, guards shall not cause physical injury to it, except under the direction of Level 2 staff. Beyond the above procedures, all personnel intending to interact with SCP-214 are to undergo psychological evaluation. Any employees with prior history of depression are not permitted to interact with it. Regular sessions of psychological observation are to occur post-research on all participants. Any personnel exhibiting two or more of the following symptoms during observation are to be quarantined immediately in identical containment to SCP-214. Self-harming behaviors. Blunted effect. Glossolalia. Logoria. Compulsive lying. Silvery discharge from mucous membranes or wounds. Obsessive compulsive behaviors, particularly in writing or speech. Research staff is heavily encouraged to read Log 214 and Interview 214 before conducting experiments as a precautionary measure. Description SCP-214 is male, age formerly an agent at the Foundation. Physical and mental changes were noted after investigation of an incident at Public Library, Massachusetts. Containment of SCP-214 is detailed in a physical examination of SCP-214 shows the replacement of most bodily fluids, including but not limited to blood, vitreous humor, seminal fluid, and cerebrospinal fluid, with a mercury-like substance. Chemical analysis shows that the substance is a suspension of complex organometallic compounds in a protein, a lipid-enriched serum, but so far, nothing more can be ascertained of its origins or purpose. Most bodily functions were observed to no longer be active in SCP-214, though the related organs still exist in a preserved state within the body cavity. This includes the brain, which no longer shows activity on electroencephalography. It shows notable selective regenerative properties, some injuries vanishing within moments of infliction, while others remain unhealed, even after a period of time in which a normal human would have recovered. SCP-214 does not experience pain normally, instead reacting to it as pleasure, with no regard to physical damage to its body. Objects have been noted to disappear in the vicinity of SCP-214. There is currently no known method of recovering lost items. Addendum 214-A Excerpts of Agent <laughs> Diary relating to becoming SCP-214 have been transcribed to Log-214. Addendum 214-B Logs of interviews with SCP-214 have been transcribed to Interview-214. Addendum 214-C Researcher has been detained after showing symptoms identical in nature to SCP-214 at the conclusion of L-214. Containment procedures have been updated to reflect the contagious nature of SCP-214. Log-214 Personal Log of Agent Date Undisclosed. I got my latest assignment. Apparently, there's reports of cult activity centered around a public library and shipping out tomorrow to investigate, along with the rest of Lambda 7. There's major concern about it being a part of Church of the Broken God, given that the location contains a large museum of machinery. Hate dealing with them. The crazy machine god thing gives me more creeps than the rest of the shit here. Most of them only kill your body. Date. Undisclosed. Initial recons back on the building. Nothing anomalous so far, with 90% of the building mapped. Only thing left is the periodicals wing. That seems to be closed for renovations. Seems like people go in there quite a bit after dark, but the door is always locked, and the architect that designed this place seems to have a personal vendetta against windows. Nothing wrong with spikes, though. This place has spikes on every surface they could think of. Team's going to shadow one of them in tomorrow and see what's going on inside. Note: Between this log and the next, the entirety of Lambda-7 vanished without a trace, along with the reported cultists. Date. Undisclosed. 
Pages upon pages flitter through my mind, breeze-born motion revealing in the saturation of information, coalesced and indexed to perfection, safely stored. The library approves of the new acquisitions to its collection, filling her walls evermore with the distilled essence of being, for all to borrow, but never keep. Subsuming the identity, enrobing oneself in another for a time for the goals for the plans and partly realized dreams. Emulating the flesh and its frailties, its ickers and impulses as a marionette on string dancing its jerky frivolity. Date. Undisclosed. Awake again. Not sure how long I've slept on the way back to- Read previous log. I think I might have been sleep deprived. It doesn't make any sense. Colt's gone. Team's gone. Writing after action report. Attempted to erase previous log, but can't see the button to do that. Compromised. The word keeps echoing in my head. I think I've been compromised. Cut myself shaving this morning and bled Quicksilver into the sink. The sensation of the blade cutting into my skin felt like a lover's caress. It's my duty to self-terminate. I've been compromised. Once the report's done, I'll do that. Still have my sidearm. 12.04 p.m. Tension. Build up. Trembling finger. Burnt cordite taste. The flash. The burst. The romance of lead entangling bone and fat, followed by orgiastic release. Date. Undisclosed. Awake again. Bullet didn't do anything. No recollection since I pulled the trigger. I was in the bathroom. Now I'm in bed. There's hotel and medical staff uniforms laying around, but no people. No remains. No signs of a struggle and not a drop of blood. Tried to call my superiors to warn them that I'm coming, but my fingers keep missing the numbers. All I can do is write in here. Something makes me think that they want this to be found. Just too late. Still bleeding out the back of my head. Something feels right about that, and the warm sensation running down is delightful. End log. Interview 214. Interviewed. SCP-214 Interviewer Researcher Forward Initial interview to ascertain the origin of SCP-214 Begin log Researcher I'd like you to tell me again about what happened at the library SCP-214 Library Home sweet home Have you been to the periodicals section? Such a lovely place Glittering with the dewy webs of knowledge strewn across the indexes Researcher. Home. Do you mean like a metaphysical home? Or did you actually plan to live there? We show your address of record as... SCP-214. I've always been there. I'm still there. Home is where the library is, after all. And this is my home now, isn't it? So this is the library now. It'll be a fine one, too, once I get everything organized. Researcher. What do you remember of before the library? Do you remember your name? Do you remember why you were sent to the library? SCP-214 Oh, my name is SCP-214, isn't it? Filed and stored away with so many other texts. I greatly admire your work. You hold so many beautiful things here. Researcher That's your designation, yes. Do you remember what it was? SCP-214 Designation. A distinguishing name. Yes, I know it. Do you remember what yours is? Researcher. Of course. But I'm not the one answering the questions here. Do you remember what happened at the library between when you arrived and you were found? SCP-214. Are you sure? Because you told me it was Alicia before. Sometimes, people lose themselves, and I wouldn't want that to happen to you. It's for your own good that you know yourself. What happened? What always happens in a library? Knowledge was exchanged. Researcher. Alicia. What? No. You're attempting to change the subject. What knowledges were exchanged in the library? With whom? Reports suggested people inside, engaging in some kind of synchronized ritual. But when we showed up, you were the only one there. What happened to the rest of the people, 214? SCP-214. I already told you. Knowledge was exchanged. Everything is information. To be stored and sorted. 
compressed if need be. Researcher, stored where? There were no traces of any other individuals inside that building when the recovery team arrived, but you were covered in the unknown sample. SCP-214, oh Alicia, you do have such a limited view of things here. You ask the wrong questions. You already know where. They're in the library. They never left. Researcher, my name isn't. We did a thorough search of the library. You were the only one inside. We didn't even pick up DNA traces. Someone or something had swept it clean. Tell me what happened in the library. What happened to those 17 people to- 214. SCP-214. You keep confusing the map for the territory, Alicia. It is a bad habit. They've been indexed in the library, stored, numbered, and sorted. Researcher, you you don't mean the building, do you? When you talk about the library. SCP-214, you do good work here. We work at complementary purposes. To secure, protect, and contain. To organize, quantify, and enlighten. You are so bright, Alicia. Just a few more steps now. Researcher, can you, can you show me the library? SCP-214, of course I can. End log. Closing statement. Said researcher was found after the interview, inside SCP-214's enclosure, leaking silvery fluid from- Item number, SCP-242. Object class, safe. Special Containment Procedures SCP-242 is kept at a home located in New Mexico, procured by the Foundation on date undisclosed. The original owner was an out-of-state landlord who had problems keeping it rented. After retiring, he moved there, but disappeared after three days. The home is unremarkable and is inhabited by Dr. and Dr. who pose as a married couple with no children. The backyard is defined along its perimeter with a cinder block wall, approximately two meters high, in accordance with the homes in the general vicinity. The pool is monitored at all times by a single level one guard, who also covers as the couple's live-in cook. Human monitoring was added after Incident 2421. Swimming or wading in the pool is strongly discouraged, and any access to the pool by anyone other than Class D personnel for experimental reasons is forbidden. Description SCP-242 is a swimming pool, approximately 4.5 meters wide by 9 meters long, with a depth ranging from 1 meter deep on both ends to 1.5 meters deep in the center, and a total volume of approximately 53,000 liters. It has a dual waterfall feature, and in-pool vacuum unit, and stairs on one end. Any substance when placed into the pool will eventually be transmuted into sterile water, which will remain sterile even after being removed from SCP-242 and introduced to a non-sterile environment. A sample taken from SCP-242 and poured into a container of water that had been tinted with red food coloring did not mix, but rather stayed together as a non-missable bubble. Subsequent examination of samples shows them to be nothing more than pure sterile water. The length of time required for the transmutation to complete is dependent on the nature of the substance placed into SCP-242. Ordinary river water sampled from New Mexico was completely sterilized in seven minutes. Stagnant pond water taken from New Mexico was sterilized in 18 minutes. 50,000 liters of coal tar was converted over the course of 12 days. While the pool contains nothing but sterile water, there is no apparent action of any of the features of the pool. Once a non-water substance is placed into the pool, the water jets and waterfall will come on, even if disconnected from any power source. The pool vacuum, if attached, will also activate and drive around the bottom of the pool, even through extremely viscous liquids. There is no cycling of water into or out of the filtration system. Pipes leading to the filtration system have been completely removed and shown to be empty and dry while the pool contents were being sterilized. Addendum Incident 2421 On 
During a time when the home was vacant but being monitored by a hidden video camera, a man and woman, apparently in their early 20s, scaled the rear wall and gained access to SCP-242. They proceeded to undress and go swimming along with two vinyl inflatable rafts acquired from the shed in the backyard. After the water jets came on, the female was startled and indicated she wanted to leave. The male claimed that it was just the automatic timer coming on to clean the pool and there was nothing to worry about. The couple continued to swim and engaged in intimate activities. 24 minutes after the jets started, the female was heard to say that the water was really warm and made her feel tingly. The male agreed and they both climbed onto their respective rafts and fell asleep holding hands. 29 minutes after the jets started, both of the rafts popped within four seconds of each other and the couple was again immersed completely in the water. At this time, significant frothing of the water began, with a deep red color being given off from the subject's locations. Subjects were heard to scream loudly and both attempted to exit the pool. Before exit was possible, the couple went under the surface, the frothing stopped and the pool went from red to clear approximately 48 seconds later. The decision was made to institute a live guard at the pool. After two weeks, a story was leaked to the press that the couple had eloped to an unknown location somewhere in Mexico. Research Log SCP-242 Experiment Number 17 Abstract What are the general properties of the water contained in SCP-242? Does the water retain any SCP-like properties when removed from the location? Proposal Determine if the water is safe for human consumption, both while in the SCP and outside of it. Required equipment and personnel Two titanium atmospheric dive suits, altered to fit the testing criteria. Two Class D personnel of like gender and race, age range to within three years. One food-grade titanium barrel, 190 liter capacity. One remotely controlled overhead crane, capable of lifting 20 metric tons. One automated titanium siphon system. One wireless communication system for separate links to and from both dive suits. One home fumigation testing unit used to create a neighborhood subterfuge. Estimated budget. Data expunged. Status. Approved. Results. Transcript attached for review. Contact Dr. for a full lab report. Doctor. Alright, once you've entered the dive suit, we'll lower you into the pool. All you need to do is take a drink from the metal straw by your mouth when instructed to do so. Test Subject A. Uh, I can't see out of this thing. Shouldn't there be glass here? Why is it all metal? Doctor. That's classified. Just get into the dive suit, please. Sound of overhead crane followed by a loud splash. Doctor. Is the barrel full yet? Test Subject B. Yep. All full. Doctor. Good. Remove the siphon and get into the other dive suit. You will not be placed into the pool. Just drink from the metal straw fed from the barrel when instructed to do so. Test Subject B. So if I ain't going in the pool, why am I getting into that thing? Doctor. <sighs> Again, that is classified. We went over this in the debrief. Just do as instructed, please. Mechanical Sounds Test Subject B. Damn, it's dark in here. There's no light? How will I find the straw when I- Oh, there it is. Doctor. SCP-242. Experiment 17. Time zero set. Test Subject A. Please take a sip from the straw and tell me what you experience. Test Subject A. Uh, it's pretty warm. There's a weird chemical aftertaste, but it doesn't last long. Doctor. Good. Thank you. Test Subject B. Please take a sip from the straw and tell me what you experience. Test Subject B. Hmm. It's cool. And tastes like, well, nothing. It's good. Doctor. Okay. A loud, long belch is heard, followed by laughter from Test Subject A. Doctor. Test Subject A, what is going on? Please take another sip. Test Subject A. Wow, I've got lots of gas. 
Ew. This stuff is really warm now, and it stings my mouth. How much longer is this test? Doctor. Okay. Test subject B, please take a sip. Test subject B. Yep. Same as before. No taste or smell at all. The water… is this water? It's cool and pleasant. Doctor. Test subject A, please repeat the process. Test subject A. Ow! This is really hot now. And hey, what the Is that one of my fillings? What the is this? Doctor. Please just report your experience as succinctly as possible. Fillings can be replaced. Test subject B. Please repeat the process. Test subject B. This is boring, Doc. Seems like a lot of hassle just to give us a drink of water. Doctor. Test subject A, please repeat. Choking and gurgling sounds. Doctor. Test subject A, please respond. Sound of a muffled scream, followed by electrical shorting. Doctor. Test subject B, please repeat. Test subject B. Ah, yep, still nice. Doctor. Okay. Test subject B, we're moving to the next phase, which is a full medical analysis. But you'll need to, uh, decompress before you can exit the suit. It will take several hours, so get comfortable in there. Please take a drink every time the indicator light goes on, and let me know if anything changes. Use the urination adapter as needed. Test subject B. Understood. Damn, that was easy. Testing was ended due to internal electrical and subsequent structural failure of atmospheric dive suit A. Retrieval was not attempted. Complete loss of atmospheric dive suit A occurred after approximately 15 hours. Test subject B was extracted after 17 hours. No physiological changes were detected. Subject B's urine was recovered and showed no extraordinary properties. Subject B has been released to the Class D pool group for future reuse. The water remaining in the barrel was left to evaporate and did so within the expected time frame. No residue of any kind remained. End log. Note: The use of SCP-242 for possible disposal of any SCP-related materials that are difficult to manage is being considered at this time. Contact Dr. for details and or permission for testing. Item number SCP-300 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-300 is stored in a locked and climate-controlled container at site Experimentation on SCP-300 may only be performed with prior written permission from at least one Level 3 senior researcher, and any observations made must be recorded for later analysis. Description SCP-300 consists of an antique glass perfume bottle, SCP-301, containing approximately 2.4 cubic centimeters of an unidentified colorless liquid, SCP-302. When a single drop of SCP-302 is extracted from SCP-301, and the drop is viewed through a standard optical microscope, an animated scene becomes visible. While no two drops have shown precisely the same scene, these scenes generally take the form of pastoral or woodland scenes, consistent with that of Victorian-era England. So far, attempts to analyze the exact chemical components of SCP-302 have inexplicably failed, with spectrometers reporting wildly variant or false data, thus making attempts at replicating it impossible. SCP-302 also invariably evaporates within two to eight hours of being drawn outside of SCP-301, despite all attempts at stabilizing the substance or controlling laboratory conditions. SCP-300 was first documented after being recovered from the attic of a row home in UK on 1863, following a raid by agents of the Royal Society for the Security, Containment, and Protection of Anomalous Artifacts. SCP-300 was transferred to SCP Foundation possession on 19 Addendum 301 Experiment Log Abridged Date Undisclosed Procedure A single drop, approximately 0.07 cubic centimeters, of SCP-302 transferred to microscope slide. 
Video recorded for approximately three hours before SCP-302 evaporated harmlessly. Details. Visible scene consists of a dirt road lined with trees of an unidentified species. Coloration of leaves suggested that the scene was taking place in autumn. A light breeze is blowing, causing some of the yellowed leaves to fall to the ground. At approximately 1 hour 7 minutes and 18 seconds, a horse-drawn carriage with a driver and two passengers passes through the scene. Clothing worn by the individuals seem to be consistent with that worn in Victorian-era England. No other significant events are recorded. Date Undisclosed Procedure A single drop, approximately 0.08 cubic centimeters, of SCP-302 transferred to microscope slide. Video record lasts approximately 5 hours. Details Visible scene consists of a rural farm. Size of wheat plants visible in scene indicate late summertime period. A family, consisting of two adults and three children of varying age, are periodically visible in various areas of the farm, performing chores. Clothing of family consistent with previously established time period. Date Undisclosed Procedure A single drop, approximately 0.07 cubic centimeters, of SCP-302 transferred to microscope slide. Video record lasts approximately two hours. Details Visible scene consists of the interior of a well-furnished residence. Within the visible area are a lit fireplace and several armchairs. Three well-dressed individuals, two men and one woman, are seen conversing while enjoying a bottle of what is presumably red wine. Lip-reading analysis of their conversation is incomplete but fragments developed so far indicate a casual political discussion regarding issues appropriate for the year 18 again in Victorian England. Date Undisclosed Procedure Two drops, approximately 0.15 cubic centimeters, of SCP-302 transferred to microscope slide for experimentation. Video record lasts approximately three hours. Details Video record is blurry and indecipherable. Although a few fragments of video have been analyzed, no useful information is gathered. Further experimentation is to be limited to a single drop of SCP-302. Addendum 302 Incident 312 On date undisclosed, Dr. was found dead in Laboratory C with cause of death being self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Laboratory video surveillance showed Dr. obsessively viewing a recent recording from an SCP-300 experiment and becoming increasingly agitated until he pulled out his sidearm and took his own life. Upon investigation, the recording was identified and analyzed as a three-hour-long recording made during an experiment on date undisclosed. The recording shows a young woman of approximately years of age, sitting in an armchair and embroidering an article of clothing while singing to herself. Further investigation showed a startling resemblance between the woman and Dr. R's late wife, who died during up to and including a birthmark visible on the left side of her neck. Experimentation on SCP-300 has been temporarily placed on hold, pending research into possible telepathic or memory-affecting capabilities. Addendum 303 Inscription Located on back of SCP-300 A world in a bottle For my beloved Nora W.A. Item number SCP-325 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-325 is to be held in a standard 30cm by 10cm by 10cm steel box. This box should be waterproofed and lined with hydrophobic rubber and stored away from any washing facilities. If SCP-325 breaches containment, standard Foundation issue NBC protection suits are to be used to spread desiccant on the affected area. All used desiccant should be incinerated according to standard incineration procedure. SCP-325 can be safely stored at any site and with any SCP. 
any personnel showing a greatly increased adherence to cleaning and hygiene than required are to be detained and given new Foundation issue overalls to be worn for the next 24 hours. After this, suspected personnel are to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. Description SCP-325 is a small bottle of washing detergent, a product commonly sold in the United Kingdom. However, the name present on the label does not match any of the company's current products. SCP-325 contains a semi-viscous green liquid, identical in chemical composition to the Naturals range of washing detergent sold by SCP-325 is a value pack container of concentrated detergent and currently contains 1,775 milliliters of fluid. One wash of SCP-325 requires 25 milliliters of liquid, as indicated on the instructions located on the rear of the bottle. This information also contains a warning detailing data expunged. SCP-325 functions in an identical way to a normal detergent, and when used will produce excellent results. Tests with Class D personnel have indicated that victims will find the quality of the wash much higher than usual. Therefore, preferring to wear a garment washed in SCP-325 over other articles of clothing, washed in normal detergent. However, lab tests have shown there to be no physical or chemical difference between garments washed in SCP-325 or other brands. Further research into low-level mimetic threats are ongoing. But as the effects of SCP-325 are contained by non-use, SCP-325 is currently classified as safe. When a garment washed in SCP-325 is worn, the subject wearing it will eventually succumb to extreme pervasive paranoid delusions related to misophobia and cleanliness. This will often induce ritualistic behaviors in the subject and has led to subjects harming themselves through excessive cleaning methods such as placing their hands in boiling water or ingesting bleach. There are currently five levels of behavior caused by SCP-325 exposure documented, with all tests past 480 total hours of exposure, resulting in the data expunged indicated on the label, unless subject expires at level 4, as documented below. All time measurements indicated in the following descriptions of behavior after exposure are indicated at the average number of hours exposed, rounded up in plus or minus 10%. Exposure refers to the time spent physically wearing garments cleaned in SCP-325. Level 1 Behavior Subjects exposed to SCP-325 for between 1 and 24 hours will exhibit majorly increased awareness of hygiene and cleanliness. This is usually characterized by excessive hand washing and ordering others to be more clean themselves. This stage will usually pass without comment. However, any staff noticing increased awareness of cleanliness around the storage area of SCP-325 should inform Level 4 clearance personnel immediately. Level 2 Behavior Subjects exposed to SCP-325 for between 24 and 96 hours will begin to display extreme misophobia and manic washing regimens. Exposed subjects will also shun others, only exiting their domicile to stockpile supplies of tinned food and cleaning agents, such as bleach. Interviews have shown that subjects view the outside world to be unclean. Level 3 Behavior Subjects exposed to SCP-325 for 96 to 240 hours exhibit complete disregard for anything that is considered by them to be unclean, including the outside world. If an object inside their abode can be cleaned by the subject, they will clean it until deemed suitably uncontaminated. All clothing that has not been washed in SCP-325 will also be rejected and most likely destroyed, along with other non-suitable items. Subjects will usually dispose of things by incineration, although no single method is preferred. From this point, only clothing washed in SCP-325 will be worn. Level 4 Behavior Currently the stage of most use and interest to the Foundation. After 240 hours of exposure, subjects will cut themselves in order to use their blood as a cleaning agent. Other agents such as bleach will sometimes be added, but this is not a constant behavior and around 80% of exposed subjects will not add anything. 
The blood from the victim has been proven to be 100% efficient at removing any contaminant from a surface. The mechanism for this is currently unknown, but tests with the products of SCP and SCP have shown promising results for cleanup after containment breaches. The composition of the blood has eluded a full analysis so far, with test results showing data expunged present in the bloodstream. Further testing is authorized after submitting Form 325-T1 to the appropriate Level 4 researcher. Most test subjects, around 70%, will die of exsanguination or exhaustion before progressing to Level 5. Level 5 Behavior Once a subject has been exposed for 480 hours, they will proceed to Data Expunged, which resulted in the deaths of several civilians and Foundation staff. This event is detailed on the warning on SCP-325's label. A copy is available to researchers above Level 3 clearance. As the company shows no record of producing SCP-325, yet has the facility to do so if the is added into their manufacture process, one undercover agent has been inserted as an employee. Said agent is to stay silent, unless production of SCP-325 is found to exist. All instances of SCP-325 found outside of Foundation control are to be destroyed by incineration after testing at the nearest Foundation site. Field agents and MTFs are cleared to terminate any civilians exhibiting confirmed exposure of Level 3 or above. Confirmed Level 2 instances are to be contained and returned to the nearest Foundation site. Item Number SCP-354 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Due to SCP-354's immobile nature, Area 354 has been built around it. Area 354 houses forces and D-Class personnel prepared to deal with threats emerging from SCP-354, as well as researchers studying SCP-354 and its properties. For their own safety, no on-site personnel are to approach SCP-354 at any time. Direct interaction with SCP-354 is permitted only for the purpose of research to eliminate SCP-354, and must be approved by O5 personnel. Area 354 was constructed to contain and neutralize any and all further threats emerging from SCP-354. At the heart of Area 354, a 20-foot wall of concrete reinforced with data expunged, has been constructed around SCP-354 to prevent emerging entities from escaping into the area at large. High-speed motion detection cameras are placed atop the wall looking down into the pool, and armed guards can easily shoot down inside the enclosure from catwalks placed above the pool. Description SCP-354 is a pool of red liquid, discovered in northern Canada. The liquid is of a consistency similar to that of human blood, hence the colloquial name, Blood Pond, but is not of a biological nature. The pool does not have definite banks. Soil mixes with the liquid until, at a certain point, there is more soil than liquid and the ground is mostly solid. The liquid becomes denser as one descends deeper into the pool. If the pool has a bottom, it has yet to be reached. Periodically. Entities emerge from the pool and attempt to escape from the enclosure. Thus far, nearly all creatures emerging from SCP-354 have been extremely hostile and highly dangerous. SCP-354 is believed to have been first discovered in by survivors of a plane crash who encountered SCP-354 by chance. SCP-354 had developed into a local urban legend long before Foundation personnel arrived to deal with the threat. After locating the source of the legend, SCP personnel set up Watch Station Epsilon-38 to monitor the pool and to deter future travelers from finding it. SCP-354 was classified as Euclid until its properties were further discovered. At 1403 hours on date undisclosed, an unidentified entity emerged from SCP-354. Contact with Watch Station Epsilon-38 was lost. Mobile Task Force was dispatched to deal with the entity and were eventually successful. All personnel at Watch Station Epsilon-38 were found dead. 
Area 354 was subsequently constructed to contain SCP-354. Document 3541A Partial log of entities to have emerged from SCP-354 prior to Event 3542. SCP-3541 Original entity which destroyed Watch Station Epsilon-38 Resembled a giant bat Neutralized by Mobile Task Force SCP-3542 Bear-sized mammalian creature Covered in razor-sharp spines Resembled an echidna Was virtually bulletproof But was unable to escape the enclosure surrounding the pool Neutralized via napalm SCP-3543 Black metallic sphere capable of levitation Emitted concentrated levels of radiation in precisely directed beams Sufficiently to instantly cripple and later result in death then area head, Dr. struck SCP-3543 with a sledgehammer, disabling it. SCP-3543 then self-detonated, causing minor structural damage and severely wounding Dr. Said doctor made a full recovery and has been commended for his bravery. SCP-3544, humanoid reptilian creature, approximately 4.6 meters or 15 feet tall escaped both the walled enclosure and Area 354 altogether. Gunfire caused very little physical harm and was highly ineffective. Mobile Task Force Omega-7, Pandora's Box, was dispatched and was successful in neutralizing the creature. SCP-3545 Data expunged. SCP-3546 appeared to be a human male of Indian descent. As the enclosure around the pool had not yet been fully repaired, SCP-3546 was immediately shot before it had a chance to escape. Area Head Dr. has expressed his displeasure in the rash execution of SCP-3546, which testing revealed to be identical to an average human being. Data Corrupt SCP-3544-14 Majority of creature's body remained well beneath the surface of the pool. Five octopus-like tentacles were seen emerging from the pool and reached up over the enclosure. Several D-Class personnel were grabbed by the tentacles and pulled back beneath the surface of the pool. After receiving massive damage from gunfire, SCP-35414 retreated back into the pool and disappeared. No personnel taken by the creature were recovered. SCP-35415 Feline creature, composed of a blue-hued crystalline structure, later revealed to be ice, was able to jump above the walled enclosure and was agile enough to dodge most gunfire, was actively hostile and mauled any personnel that engaged it. Subject engaged SCP-35416 upon its emergence from the pool and was terminated in the fight. SCP-35416 Feline creature composed of a dark red-black stone, later revealed to be partially solidified magma. Gunfire proved mostly ineffective against its hide. Was not hostile to personnel and did not attempt to escape the walled enclosure until being engaged by SCP-35415. Successfully terminated SCP-35415 and grew less active as its body cooled. After fully solidifying and having remained motionless since, subject was moved to Dr. R's office for aesthetic purposes. SCP-35418 Metallic humanoid machine, described by several D-Class personnel as a Terminator. Subject possessed a cloaking device rendering it invisible to human eyes. Subject was highly adept at combat and killed nearly 90% of Area 354's guard personnel as it rampaged through the facility. Approximately 60 minutes after emerging from the pool, subject ceased function and powered down. Subject was dismantled and its power cell was disposed of. Subject's remains are under study. Note from Area Head, Dr. That's thrice now that we've had to fall back on Pandora's box to deal with stuff coming out of SCP-354. Abel can't complain, though. You can tell he enjoyed fighting SCP-3541. 
Maybe we should set up some kind of hotline to MTF Omega-7. Document 3543A Log of Exploratory Mission 354 Alpha Personal Log of Dr. Our expedition to explore SCP-354, that gaping wound in the middle of Canada, has finally been accepted. The R&D boys have come up with what can only be described as a submarine with a drill on it. We know that the pool gets denser as you go down, so we suspect that at some point we won't be sinking so much as digging. Hence the huge mining device built onto it. It's not hydrodynamic at all, but we're not really going swimming here. My gut tells me that there's something on the other side of the red pool. And just like digging down, up to China, all we have to do is dig down, up to it. Personal log of Dr. Had a nice long debate with O5 over who's allowed to come. I wanted MTF Omega-7 to come with us for protection, or at least SCP-076, but they won't allow it. Despite the massive damages he continues to cause, they still see him as too valuable to risk losing. Not that he isn't, you know, immortal or anything. Maybe they just didn't have the guts to ask him to go exploring. Ackler, that ass, wanted us to take SCP with us, but I wouldn't allow it. The file says SCP was just born before he came through, so he'd be useless as a guide. He might be of some use as security, but that's mostly cancelled out by the fact that he's data expunged. He'd probably just expunged anyway. The final crew complement apart from myself consists of three agents, two D-class personnel, one geologist, and some guy from R&D who's going to pilot the ship. I already forgot all their names. Exploratory Team 354 Alpha, ET 354A, Mission Log, Day 1. Rotten sort of day to begin a mission. Rumor has it that last night there was a total containment breach in some area or other. Then it turns out that there's no coffee allowed anywhere inside of Area 354 for some reason or another. And the whole mission almost ended in disaster when it turns out that they almost forgot to load the extra fuel on board. Who the fuck is running the show around here? Anyway, we're now underway. For a while there, I had a definite feeling of going downward, but now we're dropping much more slowly. Marty, that's the R&D guy's name, says we're sinking at a rate of 10 meters an hour. Apparently at this depth, the red pool is pretty damn dense. Mission Log, Day 2. Nothing of interest happened, but I learned everyone's names. We have Marty, our pilot, Agent Swanson, Agent Turquoise, Agent 86, Dr. J. MacArthur, Chris Simmons, and Leroy Tucker. whoop de freaking do Mission Log, Day 3. At about 4.30 a.m., gravity suddenly changed direction. Boy, that was a fun way to wake up. We're now rising rather than sinking, which means we're more than halfway there. Mission Log, Day 4. We've reached the surface. Through the portholes, it's mostly dark, which means it's night. We can't go out yet because, for all we know, the atmosphere could be hydrochloric acid. We've got a shitload of sensors outside of the ship analyzing a bunch of stuff. Whether the air is breathable, what kind of airborne bacteria we have to deal with, and simple stuff like temperature. We'll know in eight hours whether it's safe for human life out there. Mission Log, Day 5. Turns out the air is totally safe. Except it's been night for... going on 28 hours now. What's going on? Mission Log, Day 6. Dawn finally came. The sun was huge and red. I'm a biologist, but I know enough about astronomy to know that we're orbiting a totally different star. Is this a different time, a different place, or a different dimension? Leroy guessed that we're in another plane of existence, and I think he's probably closest. The pool on this side is way bigger. More like a large pond or maybe a small lake. The banks are more defined than on our side as well. We took an inflatable raft to the shore. Marty and Simmons stayed behind and headed north. The ground here, or at least around the pool, is almost totally devoid of plant life. The only green we saw was a sort of fuzzy moss growing on the ground that looked more like a kind of mold. The ground is grayish tan dirt that's like a mixture of sand and flour. 
MacArthur said it was some mineral or another, but I forgot what he called it. I half expected all of our electronics not to work out here, but that wasn't the first thing to fail. After about two hours of hiking across flat, boring ground, the compass suddenly changed direction. Now it points to what we had previously thought to be east. Evidently, this planet's magnetics, is it even a planet? Don't work the same way ours do. Not wanting to risk getting lost, we immediately made a 180 and headed back to the ship. I could have sworn that the trip was less than half as long as the trip out. Tomorrow we'll work out a way of navigation that doesn't rely on the compass being sane. Mission Log Day 7 Lousy night's sleep The sun never went down. By my calculations, the day-night cycle here seems to last about 43 and a half hours, as opposed to 24 hours back home. That's going to take some getting used to. We agreed on a system of navigation. Firstly, we're going to travel only in a straight line to make sure that we can get back to the ship by simply turning around and heading in the other direction. Unless we encounter some kind of unnavigable jungle, we should be fine. Secondly, Marty's rigged a radio beacon thing. I don't really remember his explanation, but if we're anywhere within 800 miles, his little gizmo will be able to tell us exactly which direction to go to get back, and how far. Mission Log Day 9 We set out a few hours before the sun was scheduled to rise, but when we got to the shore, we found that the green moss stuff was everywhere. It had grown in mass significantly. My guess is the stuff shrivels up in the sun during the day and expands at night to suck in nutrients or something. We decided we didn't want to walk through it, so we went back and waited for sunrise. Sun came up and we set out again. The moss stuff was back to its smaller state. It just occurred to me that there's been no wind at all in this place. The result is dead silence. I'm not ashamed to admit that the overall emptiness of this place is pretty scary. We found an area with none of the moss stuff for a few hundred feet around, and decided to camp for the night. The sun is still up, but it's time for us humans to sleep, so I'm calling it night. Mission Log Day 10 Sometime in the night, which was really daytime. Fuck, this is going to get confusing. We were all awoken by some kind of roar. You remember what the T-Rex sounded like in that old movie Jurassic Park? It sounded a lot like that. Big and reptilian. It was so loud that I was certain whatever was making it couldn't be more than 20 feet away. But when we all got out of our tents, we didn't see anything. The whole area is so flat that we see any sort of animal within half a mile or so. But there was nothing. F***ing scary. We packed up camp and continued on. After a while, we stopped seeing the moss stuff. Maybe it only grows around the red pool. And the ground became rockier. In the distance, the land seems to grow more hilly. I think I see trees. Mission Log Day 11 The bare ground has ended. Now we're walking across a vast field of beautiful green grass. It almost looks like a well-mown lawn. The grass seemed ordinary enough until Turquoise tripped over a rock and arose to find his hands covered with several dozen bloody pinpricks. Apparently, the tip of a blade of this grass is incredibly sharp and easily punctures skin. It's no threat to our foundation issue boots, but we must all be careful not to fall on it. We came to a tiny stream, really no more than a trickle. Swanson suggested we could refill our canteens, but Leroy and MacArthur wanted to check the water for something or other first. MacArthur took out some equipment and after a few minutes announced that it was not water, but liquid carbon dioxide. CO2 is usually a gas at this temperature, and it's never a liquid. The laws of physics don't seem to be working right. Mission Log Day 14 I haven't had time to record anything for a few days. We made it to an area sparsely populated by trees. The grass there was withered and brown, and not sharp enough to pierce the skin anymore. The trees were ordinary, looked like birch, but the leaves were wrong. At some point we lost Swanson. This place is so quiet that none of us really feel comfortable talking so we have no idea when we lost him. There's a good eight hour window where he could have gone missing. We called to him, but none of us wanted to split up to look for him. During the night, a tree fell on 86's tent. He wasn't hurt and none of the gear was damaged, although the tent got mangled beyond repair. 86 swears that the tree hadn't been that close when he pitched the thing, 
and none of us can tell what caused it to fall. The trunk just snapped. We all agreed not to pitch our tents anywhere near a tree from now on. The next day, which was really nighttime, we heard the same roar from a few days ago. It sounded exactly the same as before, and again, we have no idea what made the sound, and none of us can even agree which direction it came from. Then it started to rain. We all pitched our tents for the night, this time a whole lot closer together than we had before. The nearest tree is about 300 feet away. MacArthur confirmed that it was actual rain and not more CO2 b****, and we set up this funnel thing to refill our canteens. Leroy donated his tent to Agent 86, and I offered to share mine, since it's a little bigger than the other guys. I asked Leroy what he did to wind up as a D-class. He said he raped a couple people. I think he might have been trying to freak me out, but who knows? Anyway, he's one of the most well-behaved D-classes I've ever met, so I don't think he's going to, say, assault me in my sleep. Mission Log, Day 17. Good God, the rain has finally stopped! Everything is soaking wet, including us. Except for the ground. After that much water, you'd expect it to be muddy as all hell, but the ground beneath the grass is barely damp at all. Perhaps the plants absorb moisture from the ground more efficiently than the ones back home. We're setting out again. Perhaps the rain awakens some animal life. Data corrupt. Mission log. Day 25. What seemed to be a huge cliff in the distance turned out to be an artificially constructed wall. It's made of solid, rusty iron that stands maybe 50 feet high. To the left and to the right, it goes on farther than the eye can see. I can't imagine how thick it is. We have no way around it. We'll have to go over it or through it. We made camp for the night. We'll work out what to do in the morning. Mission Log, Day 26. Leroy jury-rigged some kind of blowtorch thing with our equipment. I swear, this guy's f***ing MacGyver. We cut a hole in the iron wall big enough for us to go through. It turns out it's only about a quarter of an inch thick, but there's another wall behind it with less than a foot between. Apparently, this thing has multiple layers. Leroy cut through eight of them before we finally made it to the other side. The grass on this side is black. Not burnt or anything, it's just a different color. And finally, there's some wind. I was getting tired of... Data corrupt. Concluded that coming here was a mistake. We have to turn back. Mission log, day 39. We passed through the second barrier, and we're back to the weird place with the black grass. I half expected the whole Leroy cut through it to have sealed up or something, but it was still there. Thank God, or whoever runs the show in this world. I don't think MacArthur is going to make it through the night. He lost a lot of blood. Mission Log, Day 40. We awoke to find that MacArthur had crossed. We didn't want to do it, but we had no choice but to terminate him. 86 said that something back home might be able to help him, and he may have been right, but we couldn't afford to have him slow us down. We only have a few more days until- Data Corrupt. Mission Log, Day 48. We made it back to the ship with only an hour or two to spare. The first thing they asked us was what the fuck happened to Swanson, Turquoise, MacArthur, and 86. As if a few dead team members are our biggest problems right now. Marty has us underway, and we're definitely sinking. I just hope they don't. Data corrupt. End of log. This document was discovered in the Central Foundation database. No such mission to explore SCP-354 has yet been suggested or approved. No records of any personnel mentioned in this log exist. The log's origin is unknown. Note from Area Head Dr. It has been 22 months since the last entity emerged from the pool. Before this, the longest period of time between emergences was 8 months. I suspect this means one of two things. Either the Red Pool has died or powered down, or whatever the correct term for it is or it is charging up for something big to come through. O5 believes the former is the most likely explanation, and has recalled 30% of our total personnel and cut 25% of our funding. While I can only hope that they are correct, if the latter situation is true, we're soon to face some terrible monstrosity, and we won't have anywhere near the force necessary to deal with it. I worry for all of our safety. Document 3544 Event Log, 
3-5-4-20. In the morning of Data Expunged, the entire staff of Area 354 evacuated the facility. However, the staff also shut down power to the area and took a number of supplies and vehicles from the facility, indicating that the evacuation had not been done due to an emergency. Mobile Task Force Theta-12 was dispatched to investigate the cause of the evacuation and, if possible, make contact with area staff. However, before MTF Theta-12 could make contact with Area 354 or its evacuees, the area's on-site warhead was detonated, resulting in the destruction of the entire facility and the deaths of Data Expunged. MTF Theta-12 was ordered to make contact with the evacuated personnel and, in the event of hostility, was given clearance to terminate any uncooperative personnel. A large convoy of vehicles taken from Area 354 was spotted heading southward from Area 354 at high speed. Final audio logs from NTF Theta-12 indicate that the convoy was made up of Area 354 staff and that the previous chain of command had broken down in its entirety, with armed D-Class personnel and research personnel firing upon MTF Theta-12. MTF Theta-12 was annihilated, and no further contact with the former personnel of Area 354 has been made since. Document 3545 Following the total destruction of Area 354, the Red Pool containment site was constructed in its place. Basic maps of the new facility can be found in Unlike the previous facility, which was focused on research and neutralization of entities emerging from SCP-354, the new facility is devoted entirely to the containment of SCP-354 and entities which may emerge from it, as well as any unforeseen forces which it may create directly. This is due largely to the advisement of the new site head, Data Expunged, who believes that the events of Log 35420 were the result of a psychic or mental attack generated by SCP-354 itself. Document 3546 Interview between Dr. and Agent regarding Data Expunged. Doctor, is it alright if I record this? Agent, yes, go ahead. Doctor, good, good. So, let's start at the beginning. What happened at the Red Pool containment site? Agent, looking back now, it seems strange that nobody ever suggested draining the pool. When Dr. came up with it, it seemed like such a good idea at the time. Doctor, exactly what about the idea was so appealing? Agent, it was a way out. That SCP entry, I've read what it says. It's a joke. It makes it seem like we have the pool under control. Doctor, I take it you do not. Agent, there's a half meter slab of reinforced concrete in place over the pool. And yet every time some beast tries to come through somehow, it manages to get loose into the building. People die. Every single time. I've seen data expunged. A man's own intestines. Can you imagine what that looks like, old man? Doctor. So, to you. And of course to the other people stationed at the Red Pool containment site as well. Draining the pool seemed like a fine solution to the suffering caused by SCP-354. Agent. Chair scrapes as Agent stands up. Suffering. That thing doesn't just... Doctor. Please sit down. This is going on record. Pause. Agent sits. So, O5 approved the draining of SCP-354. And then what happened? Agent. They evacuated the non-essential personnel to a location a couple kilometers away, leaving just basic defense crew and the people who'd run the equipment. Mostly D-Class, plus a few agents to keep things going. Doctor, and you were among those agents. Agent, yes. Doctor, how did they go about draining the pool? Agent, tech guys brought in this big pump thing with all these hoses. We retracted the slab, but... Doctor, but... Agent, have you ever had a dream where it seemed so real but you knew you were dreaming, and it felt like you had to wake up to escape from it. Doctor, I can't say I have. Agent, yes you have. We all have. That's what it felt like when they put the hose in to try to drain it. Everything stopped being real. 
It was like we had to escape right now. Doctor, and you were the only one feeling this sensation. Agent, no. Everyone had it at the same time. It came from the f***ing pool! Doctor, please, lower your voice. What happened when they activated the pump? Agent, we never did. We couldn't. It wouldn't let us. Doctor, what wouldn't let you? Agent, the pool! Doctor, please, I ask you to lower your voice. Agent, up until now, it's been content just throwing monsters at us. It's been playing. But now we have it locked up, and we just tried to execute it. Now it's angry. Doctor, to PA. Guards, please restrain Agent Agent, my buddy measured its banks once and compared them to the photos from its first discovery. You know what he found? Agent grabs Doctor Doctor. Guards! Agent, it's growing. The pool is growing. It gets bigger and stronger every day. And now we've made it angry. Get your hands off! Doctor, sedate him. We'll continue this in the morning, if he's lucid by then anyway. Item number, SCP-365. Object class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-365 is to be kept in its testing pool at all times. The door to the pool is to be locked and guarded by one security guard. Experiment requests must be approved by a level 3 researcher. Description SCP-365 is a green pool noodle made of polyethylene foam. By itself, it displays no unusual properties and is physically identical to a typical noodle of similar size. SCP-365's unusual properties manifest only when it is placed in a body of water. When a subject completely submerges in said body of water, they become unable to get out. Subjects report a sense of dread and describe themselves in an infinite sea, swimming endlessly in a direction and finding only more water. It is important to note that to outside observers, the subject simply seems to be flailing in place. The only way to remove a submerged person from the water is to remove SCP-365, negating its effects. All other methods of rescue have failed. Cables and ropes have exhibited an unnatural resistance and snapped. Drainage systems have failed, and human intervention has led to data expunged. Addendum 3651 SCP-365 was discovered in on date undisclosed. Retrieval personnel found it at the public pool, along with the bodies of several civilians. Because SCP-365's properties were unknown at the time, agents lost their lives. SCP-365 was eventually found and removed from the pool, and carbon monoxide from an improperly maintained water heater was used as a cover story. Addendum 3652 On date undisclosed, Researcher discovered that Hallway 19 of Storage Site 23 was flooded. Said researcher noticed water leaking from SCP-365 storage locker at a rate of 5 liters per minute. She quickly notified Dr. who opened the locker to find SCP-365 producing water from its holes. SCP-365 was subsequently moved to its testing pool, whereupon the flow of water stopped. SCP-365's containment procedures have been changed accordingly. Item Number SCP-379 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-379 is to be kept in a vault at Sector when not in use. When being transported, it should be carried in a locked and padded container, such as a padded briefcase, as the bottle is fragile. As our supply is limited, all testing and experimentation must be authorized by Dr. beforehand. Description SCP-379 is a translucent pale silver liquid contained in a small crystal bottle. The bottle is topped with an atomizer cap, which delivers approximately one half milliliter of the clear substance inside the bottle. The bottle itself has no noted properties of any particular interest. However, 
the liquid inside, while scentless and ineffective to normal human beings, has the strange effect of inducing a state not unlike human infatuation upon electronic and mechanical devices. When applied to a person or some object, any machines or electronics in the vicinity, aside from those wearing SCP-379, will begin running in an overheated state, unable to process as many commands and consuming more energy. For cybernetic systems or computers deemed sentient, the target seems to exhibit more humanistic qualities of typical infatuation, including a preference to be around or in contact with the wearer of SCP-379, more willingness to cooperate with anyone in the room while the wearer of SCP-379 is present, slower response times in machines, a slightly higher chance of minor glitches and malfunctions. It has been suggested to expose aggressive SCPs, such as SCP to SCP-379, to see if the pheromone can reduce their aggressiveness, perhaps allowing us to ask more questions about their function. It has also been suggested to try SCP-379 on SCPs that are not mechanical and do not exist in our 3D, real-world state, as is the case of SCP-732, to see if the pheromone affects them, deemed unlikely. There is no known reason as to how the sporting of SCP-379 affects most machines. SCP-379 does not release any sort of scent or detectable pheromone into the air. It has been suggested that SCP-379 has an electromagnetic frequency of some sort, but tests have proven this theory inconclusive. Further tests are to be limited until chemical composition is established to determine if SCP-379 can be artificially replicated. Addendum 379A Experiments with SCP-379 and SCP-915 show that purely mechanical devices of sufficient complexity could be affected by SCP-379. SCP-915's intake of air increased threefold, but this was not accompanied by a detectable increase in computation speed. Requests have been made to test if the internal shifts of SCP-915 increase in response to SCP-379. Due to the lack of quantities of SCP-379, continued experiments with SCP-915 are denied. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.